This is Dolany TV, ladies and gentlemen, on a bright, beautiful, sunny day that I have not really been enjoying. I think it's about time to do that, and I can't do that until I talk to you guys today about something that came out from The Athletic, the Edmonton uh, Bureau of The Athletic. Of course, I don't have access to the article because I'm not a subscriber. I, that's, that's not the way I like doing things, so uh, it's hard enough paying for Sportsnet now at this point. Anyway... That's not the point of today. Today, the point, that athletic article, taking a look at the advantages the Oilers might be able to make in the defensive trade market, right? We've already seen Ole Mata go for a fifth-round pick and Dominic Cahoon, which realistically, if you ask Pittsburgh Penguins fans, I don't think they could have done much better from what I've seen on Twitter. I follow about three or fours, and they seem pretty over-the-moon ecstatic that they were able to get... Uh, Dominic Cahoon and a pick for Ole Mata, who was really, really, really starting to not perform so much as uh, Pittsburgh Penguins fans might have once hoped, if you know where I'm going with that. I might not be 100% accurate in my take, but that's that's the overall feeling I have from everything I've read on Twitter the last, whatever, just shy of 24 hours. Anyway, guys, for the Oilers, the way you look at it here is I have to break it down to you on this terms, right? We have the Bubbling, uh, here, I'll, I'll read what you have from Jonathan Willis, the article writer for The Athletic. The Oilers are well positioned to take advantage of a market paying premium prices for defenders between a bursting at the seams prospect depth chart and a need to move money to upgrade a barren forward core. It's probable that Edmonton will deal someone. And according to the hockey writer's rumor site, he mentioned that they were looking at Adam Larson as being the impact piece in a move. Well, you look at this way. The Oilers are spending on eight NHL defensemen, with Joel Person included. You're spending $26 million. So you would divide that. That's the crazy number, $26 million. And you go right like that, divided by eight. That's $3.2 million per defender. That's not realistically that bad. But it's also not realistically that great, right? If you could be closer to about $3 million, you'd be better. And obviously, if you move someone like Brandon Manning, that solves a lot of issues, right? That does include Brandon Manning as well, by the way. And you move somebody like, I don't know what, Chris Russell or an Adam Larson. Adam Larson, as I mentioned, had been mentioned. But Chris Russell, again, a guy that could be moved... Uh, Matt Benning, a guy that's been rumored to be moved several times over. I've asked him to be moved several times over. It's it's a challenge to figure out what the best defensive build for this Oilers team is. Because on one hand, you have a lot of Oilers fans and a lot of outside fans who will say the development of Darnell Nurse over the course of this year is thanks to Chris Russell. But at what point does a student not need the teacher anymore? That's the question I'd ask. And with Darnell Nurse, obviously, you, you cannot move him. You cannot afford to move Darnell Nurse, who is absolutely electric. Not, not so much defensively, but scoring-wise for the Oilers this year. And Chris Russell, I know it's a modified no-trade, no-movement clause. That's the tough part there. $4 million a season, though. That's the thing. $4 million a season right there. Offensively, you're not getting your money's worth. Defensively, most of the time, you're getting your money's worth. You look at Adam Larson, who's at $4.16 million, and this is why I think he was mentioned, is he's an interesting candidate just based on these facts right here. 82 games played, 20 points, a top-pairing defenseman who was a minus 28. So if you're looking to move a guy like Adam Larson, in my opinion, what you'd be looking at is not so much finding someone of value on the defensive end to bring back, finding a value pick no no no. you're looking for that value forward which is mentioned in the Jonathan Willis article however the key piece here you can look at it no matter what you're acquiring what you're looking at on your back end is yes you get a young piece into the back end at some point whether it be Joel Person whether it be Caleb Jones Evan Bouchard or a guy like Ethan Bear but what you're what you're missing in this whole formula, what I don't think anyone looks at, is the fact that if you do a move for either Russell or for Larson, what you end up doing is you are banking that Andre Sekera is going to return 
to a 25, 30 point defenseman next year. That's exactly what you're asking yourself. And for Adam Larson, he hasn't been a, well, frig, he hasn't been a 20 point defender regularly in his career since 2014, 2015 when he had 24 points. This was actually a career high as an Edmonton Oiler. I didn't know that. That's something I couldn't have told you. 19 points was his previous total in 16-17. He was a plus 21 that year. Though. That's the key. And then this year, 20 points. So, okay, he's maybe he's set in career highs. I don't really know how you can judge that by any means. And the year previous, he would have set a career high, but he, uh, he had some family matters, if I remember correctly. So, take that all into account. Take that all into account. You're looking at Adam Larson, Chris Russell, Matt Benning. I mean, Andre Sacker, I've mentioned it several times over, but, right, it is a move that is going to get that value added and realistically you look at it and you see that Chris Russell, Adam Larson are going to get you the best return, Matt Benning kind of third tertiary to that, and then Andre Sacker would be your fourth highest valued defenseman. Now everyone's maybe going to argue that you could sit there and say, hey, why don't we move Oscar Clefbaum? But guys, Oscar Clefbaum is just still he's young enough that he, if he ever gets it right and plays a full 82, we're going to see points out of him that are unreal in total so you don't want to give up on him quite quite yet because that would be a scary situation and I think that's exactly what we're seeing out of a guy like Ken Holland is that you're not going to be doing that and that's why maybe the Adam Larson move doesn't make so much sense but then you all of a sudden look at it and then that only leaves you with Chris Russell who's your second highest rated defenseman and what can you get for Chris Russell in terms of a forward. That's the question. I, I can't even throw a package together to figure a one for one for Chris Russell for a forward. Maybe, as has been suggested several times, I've suggested you move the first pick, the eighth overall, and you move Chris Russell with it if you can find a way for him to, well, basically waive the no trade, waive the no movement clause and say, okay, let's go out there, get it done, and find somebody a top six forward. Well, obviously, what what can you find there? Maybe, maybe, like I suggested yesterday, you can find a guy like Nikolai Ehlers in that price range. Maybe, possibly, depending on what Winnipeg's desperation level is. You can probably find something out to east. It's, it's a tough question, realistically, when you're looking at what can you get for an eighth overall pick and a 32-year-old defenseman who's soon to be 33. I mean, same thing with Andre Sekera kind of deal, right? But oh, it's tough. Chris Russell, the other side too, as I said, was the offensive sticking point. 13 points two years ago, 21 points a year ago, and 16 points this past season. So he's, he's uh, consistent, consistently below 21 points on a defensive year. The problem is, how many people in the NHL hockey world are specifically nowadays trying to fit a guy into the decor for $4 million saying all you have to do is block shots. That's the question, right? I, again, same thing with the Adam Larson contract. If we could get a 500 k 600 700 k cheaper, I would be much happier with Chris Russell's contract than $4 million. But it is the price you had to pay at that time. Maybe not so much for a guy like Chris Russell, but pretty much for anyone else. And that's probably what Shirelli was like. Oh man, if I want this guy, I better just pay Chris Russell. We already have him signed. Well, what do you do? What do you do, right? So that begs the question all around. How primed are the Oilers to go out there and take advantage of this market like Jonathan Willis suggests? Well, it, it depends who you're bargaining with. If you're bargaining with a team that knows you're in a cap bind, maybe not so much. But if you're bargaining with a team that's in a cap bind, like the Leafs, like the Winnipeg Jets, I don't know, maybe Vegas, somewhere out there in cap land. Actually, hold on, I can tell you who's in cap hell. That's, that's something easy for me to do, no duh. So you look at the cap space, everyone who's got 70 million committed or more, the Dallas Stars, the Montreal Canadiens, the Anaheim Ducks, the Toronto Maple Leafs, Tampa Bay Lightning, Tampa's always an interesting one, Nashville Predators, and 
then you've got the Pittsburgh Penguins and Vegas Golden Knights up there as well. So those are your top 10 highest spenders. I mean, if you could find something maybe with the Bruins or Red Wings, Capitals as well, possibly something could be worked out there. But you just don't really know in positional breakdown. The thing is, you got to look at the people who have injury relief. Well, you've got Vegas with injury relief. You've got Arizona with injury relief. Toronto with injury relief. Dallas with injury relief and Detroit with injury relief so those might knock those guys off the table when you start talking how you work them but again if you start dealing with some of those maybe you can find someone right and if you can find an RFA or you can find an RFA next year you can find some bargaining chips to start drawing the line say hey Russell and a first for this or Larson in a first for this, or Larson in a second for this, Russell in a third for this, and get that top six forward. I don't, I don't care. We don't need a winger to play with McDavid. Anyone can play with McDavid and dry settle as long as they let him play in the sandbox. That's realistically all it comes down to. Whereas Nuge needs a consistent winger. And if you can move $4 million off the back end, have Sekera come back and be a 25-point defenseman, and, of course, have Person, Jones, Bear, or Bouchard step in and give you 20 points, 30 points, whatever, maybe even only 10. You're so much further ahead. Guys, let me know what your thoughts are below. Who would you target? I'm not even going to suggest names. Who would you target out there for the Oilers if you're trading Adam Larson or if you're trading Russell? Give me both. Let me know. Guys, I'm Tyson. This is Stolen TV. As always... I will catch you in the next one.